information-based sites, but through a money service. Back in the late 1990s, one man saw that the web's ability to function globally, unregulated and uncontrolled by individual governments meant ordinary people had a new channel to freely move money around the world. Peter Thiel is not as well known as Bill Gates or Tim Berners-Lee, but he should be. He's the man who founded PayPal, a revolutionary international money transfer system, in effect, a new global currency. Through PayPal, money can be moved across national borders through abstract cyberspace. By 2008, it was handling $60 billion in transactions every year. I came to believe that the place in which the uh, decision would be made for the individual or for the state would not be in the halls of politics or in public debates or in things like that, but in the development of new technologies. And that basically the future of the 21st century is going to involve some version of globalization and we have to get globalization to work. And, and you know, that means we have to somehow uh, figure out ways to break down certain barriers that exist between, between people. The origins of PayPal lie at Stanford University, just outside San Francisco. Thiel met Max Levchin, a computer scientist, at a seminar. They hit it off, and their collaboration would lead to PayPal. Now, for Thiel, he saw this as an opportunity to make some money. But he also saw it as a chance to put some of his deepest held beliefs into practice. The slogan we had for PayPal was that it was the new world currency and that it was going to somehow change the way the world thought about money. It was going to change the meaning of money, the way people would transact, and would basically, um, in some sense, uh, give people uh, sovereignty over their money in a way in which uh, they had not had it ever before. PayPal's system allows ordinary people to transfer small amounts of money internationally. And like so much of the web, it caught authority on the hop. Is PayPal a bank? Is it a payment service? Is it a money transmitter? It, strictly speaking, did not fall under any regulatory frame. And, um, and so there was, there was an opening during which the company could be built, and then you'd figure it out later. Peter Thiel next saw the potential of Facebook as a way of forming communities not bound by nationality. He was a key early investor in what has become the world's largest social network. Facebook now has 350 million users worldwide. If it was a country, it would boast the third biggest population in the world. The web has led to um, all kinds of new social groups. Uh, and I think in part it is simply because the existing ones have been extraordinarily constrained by geography and history. And these are not necessarily the best ways for groups to be organized. Uh, you often want to have groups with people you have things in common with, or people you can learn from. The internet has liberated individuals, it's challenged existing power structures of nation states, and the future is still somewhat open, but certainly the first uh, 15 years are very positive. Peter Thiel is a true web visionary. He saw how the web would shrink the world, how it would establish new ways of doing things, bypassing tradition and rendering the old redundant. But the web offers a flip side to Thiel's vision. There are other pioneers of the web who see in it a way to turn a community against the world, not to create a new openness or broader allegiances, but to narrow identity. Before the web, extremists tended to be scattered in small numbers around the world. The web linked them all, gave them new tools, allowing them to seize the initiative. Al-Qaeda quickly recognized this new medium's ability to spread the message of fear and terror. Islamist groups have now chosen to primarily disseminate their material through the internet because this way they can be fully in control in how the message is disseminated and where. Pretty much every day, Al-Qaeda 
and the Taliban are putting out, um, I suppose you could call them propaganda videos, where they're showing attacks or they're eulogizing particular leaders, one who's perhaps been killed in a drone strike. They will do a long, maybe even 40 minute video, mainly of somebody talking about this person's great deeds, interspersed with, um, with really quite high quality video. A lot of the message is based on anger and arousing anger. They use a lot of images, images of women and children killed or you know, other horrific images. It's more like shock tactics to kind of get you into gear, create that kind of sense of urgency. Al-Qaeda, like the internet, has no center. It's a dispersed group of loosely associated people. Wherever jihadists are in the world, the web lets them talk to like-minded people, and their belief system is instantly reinforced. The web acts as a kind of virtual, portable homeland. The concept of a portable homeland refers to how different groups operating in different countries in the world who have similar aims can use the internet as a space that links all of them. So the internet replaces in some way the borders of a particular country for each of these groups and links them as if they all live in one place. After 9-11, when the Taliban were driven out at the time from Afghanistan, they moved to Pakistan. And a very important way of staying in touch with them was through cyber cafes, internet cafes, because they knew they couldn't get on mobile phones for fear of being tracked. And a lot of the terror plots that we've seen in this country have been traced back to cyber cafes in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, and elsewhere. The web collapses distances. Fanatics the world over can talk to each other with ease. The web allows them to create and live in their own little worlds. This is something Ishtak Hussein saw firsthand in London when he was a member of Hizb Tahir, the Party of Liberation. If you live in an area where there's no like-minded people, you can just go on the web and communicate with people who are like-minded, so you don't even need to physically meet them. You've had individuals who've gone online, they've never even met members of these groups, yet they've read their writings, gone on their websites and radicalised themselves, a bit like your DIY type of uh, terrorist. And we had a few cases here in the UK. Um, so the web definitely does play a big part in this. We are 100% committed to the cause of Islam. We love death the way you love life. I tell all you British citizens to stop your support to your lying British government. This is what web critics call cyber balkanization. The web allows users to filter their worldview through selective reading and connections. Cranks speak unto cranks and reinforce their extremism. The way the web can help trap groups in their own twisted worldview is something that nags away at the man who created the web in the first place in the hope that it would connect humanity, not divide it. When they go to a website, the website only links to other websites which believe the strange things that these people believe. And then don't you then get people who end up sitting just by their computers communicating in such a way that when they meet somebody in the street, the only way to can communicate with them is to shoot them. No, that is one vision of a horrible cultural pothole. I think one of the greatest paradoxes of the web is that on the one hand, we applaud it for giving us all a voice and for giving us tremendous power. But on the other hand, this power can be used for good or for ill. As we put more and more of our lives on the web, we're becoming more and more vulnerable to the bad elements, to the networks of hate, and to the darker uses of the web. The most extreme example of this menacing side of the web was plain to see as recently as 2007, when a whole country was almost brought to its knees via an assault directed through the web. Estonia, a tiny country of one and a half million people situated on the border with Russia, has been described as the most wired country in Europe. 97% of all banking transactions are done online. So this was a tempting target for any so-called cyber warrior. We are very involved in the digital revolution, if you will, and uh, therefore we need to protect this because if something does go wrong, uh, we are uniquely vulnerable and uh, we don't want to lose this way of life. 